Welcome everyone to an episode of The Definitive Crusade. I'm your host, Joining the Machine Hughes, and joining me this week is absolutely nobody. That's right. Unforeseen circumstances have it that the 13th Crusader, Freya, and Matthew were all unavailable. Uh, to the guys that have uh, day jobs, go get them, earn that money. And for Freya, who's feeling unwell, Freya, hope you feel better soon. Um, normal service will resume in a fortnight's time or so. So, without further ado, let's get into some stuff. It's that simple. You've still got me. We can still talk some stuff. So, here's how it works. This week sees the release on DVD and Blu-ray um, of Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 1, the animated uh, movie, which is there as a kind of precursor to the end of the current animation universe. I've got the trailer all keyed up, ready for you to go. Give me two seconds, and you can have a look at this. Here we go. Most of you are aware that you live in a reality parallel to many versions of your universe. I've gathered you all to save your world. That does not look good. You got that right. The threat is real. I was on one of the Earths that was swallowed by this wave. <laughs> well, who we have here? I come from a parallel Earth. We look down on supervillains. Welcome our newly formed team of heroes. The Justice League. Drain the power from them. Thank you, Justice League. Something's about to happen. Something major. I am Harbinger. This is the thing. Yeah, I figure. You each possess the skills, strength, and speed to save your universe. Great Scott. What's happening? The universe, it's all vanishing. Look! This is it. I won't let you go. Is it as bad as it looks? Yes. Five, four, three, two, one. So there you have it. It is out on digital as we speak. Um, DVDs out uh, the same day this has dropped so congrats go look that up um, I've seen the movie um, I know the current animation style doesn't have a lot of fans I know that some people prefer um, can we be honest it's the Batman animated series that we all love and prefer but still times have moved on we have to get with the we have to get with the the current standard um, for my for my money there's a lot going on in the in the show so you have to really pay attention uh damn it barry can come into it more than once um but all in all i thoroughly enjoyable it's two two parts man two parts um so prepare be prepared for a bit of a cliffhanger so see if you can play easter eggs with who's who on the old uh rosters there i thought you saw a couple of newbies in well not newbies i suppose but some un, some original character well, Characters that you think to yourself, well, I've never seen them on animation before. Uh, good to see some classics in there. So check it out. Let me know what you think. It's all well and good. All good fun. Um, next up, then, is the start of our comic books. Um, with there only being me here, this show is not going to last as long as the normal hour. So um, apologies for that. If you set yourself an hour for sitting back and chilling and listening and watching this, then sorry. Um, but we'll see what we can do about giving you some uh, cool content. Uh, first up is this Dozy. We were actually looking at this on the advert for this a little while ago. This is John Constantine, Dead in America, part one, or issue one, of eight. Um, it's from the Sandman universe, so therefore it's written by Simon Spurrier, art by Aaron Campbell, colours by the incomparable Jordi Belair, and Adita Bidica is on letters. Um, a whole host of people um, and people on this show as well have wanted Hellblazer and John Constantine to get back to where he belongs, stop hanging out with the Justice League uh, dogs. I mean, darks. 
um, and kind of get on with what he does best, which is, I don't know, I guess, alienating people and being a smart ass, all those sort of things. Um, this book then is a bit of a return to form for that. Um, I'm not sure it's quite as quite as clever as Mean Spirit as the, the previous iteration. When I say previous iteration, I mean the, the vertical version because um, John Constantine's superhero doesn't work for me. I very much feel that he's best left to his own own devices. I would love to see um, Zatanna in a sort of Black Label book. If we can get that sorted, that's great. Um, I think she fits Black Label more than Constantine fits superheroes. Um, if there's nobody else to argue with me, I must be right. That's cool. Um, so I'm going to look through this book. Um, now, graphically, there's nothing too mature in there. However, um, there is a, <laughs> a plethora of swear words and cursed language in this. So um, there are no hidden words, no symbols for words. Frey would be pleased to see that. However, there is quite a lot of um, vulgarity in this and from that point of view. Um, a whole range of words, whether it be F-bombs, C-bombs, B-bombs, all of them get dropped. Um, so we're going to flick through this book. Uh, bear in mind, if you do feel you're going to be upset by that language, uh, you know, just skip ahead about five minutes. That'll be fantastic. Okay, cool. Um, right, so here we go. Starts off with a zombie up in the high hills of Hollywood um, before you get a bit of a recap. Um, which is handy to have, to be fair. Seems that John's got himself a body cart. Seems he's got himself a potential son. Um, and from there on in, it's kind of like John trying to work out what the hell's going on. He hasn't got a heartbeat. What's happened? Um, has he been demonised? Um, who's the kid? Uh, and so on. It is a talky book in the most part. Um, it's part of its setup, part of its recap, but it's has a sense of macabre to it. I think it works really well. Um, the art I feel from um, Aaron Campbell reminds me a lot of Francesco Francavilla, which isn't a bad comparison. I mean, we all love Francavilla's work when he was on uh, some of the Batmans and the Batman covers that we've seen in the past. Um, the colours by Belair are fantastic. Everyone knows that I love Belair, so there's not going to be a change of pace there. Um, Things do get a little bit screwy. Um, Dream makes a, an appearance, or Sandman makes an appearance in the in the in the book, and from there on, it does get a little bit hypertextual. Um, again, gorgeous colours throughout, um, and we see that um, Constantine is still being a bit of a player as you'd expect him to be. So, if that's if that's your bag and that's what you like about Constantine, you'll see, be well versed in that. Um, in order for Constantine to get to where he wants, it's a quest. Now, he has to go and do this, to do that, to do this, to do something else. And whilst I'm not against that per se, um, excuse me, I do feel, I do feel that I've had my fill of this sort of thing. Because, I mean, if you watch stuff like The Mandalorian, I mean, The Mandalorian is supposed to be a badass, right? And yet, every time he needs something, he goes somewhere to get it. He's told you have to do this for me first before you get what you want. And if he's a badass, why doesn't he just, you know, be a badass about it? I don't know. I'd, same with Constantine. He's supposed to be a badass. So, yeah, he still has to go through these trials and tribulations. I don't understand why they put, put him through these trials and tribulations. You know he's going to cheat. You know he's going to try and scam his way out of it. You know he's going to try and stack the deck a certain way. So why bother putting yourself through that? I have no idea. Um, with all that said, I am not the world's biggest Hellblazer fan. Uh, we picked this book. Um, ideally, Frey was going to go through this. Um, if you are a, a, a bona fide Constantine fan, um, then this book should be pretty much up your street. I, it's a lot. It's a lot more um, as expected, I suppose. Uh, you know, it's a it's a detour from the superhero version, as I said earlier which is all well and good. Um, nine panel pages. You don't think even the magician would get rid of nine panel pages. <sighs> Kill me. Um, but then, golf clubs, that sounds like hell to me. 
you know, but what do I do? I'm a Dolphins fan. Um, all I feel that if you are a if you are a Constantine fan, you will get a buzz out of this. You will get a kick. Your hero's back, or your anti-hero, or the guy you love to hit, whichever way it is. I do feel there's a certain charm um, that's lacking in this book. I don't know whether it's because they're trying too hard or um, the language. So you can have a mature book without having tons of swearing in it. To be fair, um, but then if that's the thing that you know. If that's what makes it mature for some people, then who am I to complain, right? I don't know. Um, next up, <laughs> from the sublime uh, to the ridiculous somewhat, we're going to take a look at a book that's quietly been getting a lot of um, attention. Um, the covers are gorgeous. Um, and this is just, remember, these are just the standard covers. These aren't the, the variant ones that you have to pay, you know, $25 plus for. Um, Catwoman, um, Catwoman 61, um, oh no, yeah, 61, um, written by Tina, Tina Howard, Stefano Raffaele is on art, Veronica Gandini is on colours, and Lucas Catoni is on letters. Now, I haven't been minding this book for a while now, and I, part of it's because I love the purple, purple suit, it's a classic, um, Part of it's because this whole new near immortality thing that she's got going on that's interesting for a short while. Um, that said, things take a little bit of a turn on this one. It gets a little bit wonky. Um, again, fantastic cover. Um, I, so, as you know, she's now got um, nine lives, of which she's got six left, right? So she's going to use these six lives in order to complete the heists that are just normally too dangerous for her to do, okay? Um, before we get into the nitty-gritty, we get a seemingly pointless interlude of Gotham City and, a, you know, a mama kitty and a baby kitty, a uh, baby mama cat and baby cat, although that would be kitten, I suppose. I don't know why we have to go to such lengths. Um, to demonstrate that Selena is lonely, um, stuck where she is, um, but still, you know, she's still surrounded by cats. Um, some freaky stuff going on with this cat here, um, but time will tell. Um, so she decides that she's going to uh, steal a radioactive gem um, from a, a, <laughs> a, you know, um, from a reactor, a disused, blown-up reactor. Because in her head, her lives will mean that she comes back, she'll be fine. Um, however, she hasn't taken into consideration the fact that um, radiation kills over a period of time. Um, and as she gets further and further into the silo, uh, you can see start, things start to happen, teeth fall out, her skin's bubbling, that sort of thing. Comes to the realisation here that if she falls here, and then she's resurrected here through the meteor powers, the meteorite powers. Then she's just going to keep dying all over. So really, she's you know this is a great way to get rid of all your lives in one go. A painful way, to be said, but still. Um, you think that's it? She's done for. But then a cat goddess turns up, and this is where things start to get a little bit wonky. I was kind of okay with the idea of her siphoning some of the powers off. Uh, Vandal Savage, when the meteor uh, meteorite got got exposed in Gotham as part of the Gotham War, I was okay with that. That made a, a, like a modicum of sense. Having a, a cat god rock up, I'm not quite so sure. And yes, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, "Machine, wasn't there a cat god similarly to this in in the Gotham War end?" Uh, yeah, there was, and we all kind of just blew it off. Um, but still, uh, here we are. Um, art wise, I think there's a when you read a Catwoman book, you expect a certain thing, rightly or wrongly, you know, judge or not judge, it's entirely your call. Um, you expect, you know, curvy, curvy girls, 
finger hugging the tire, doing whatever it is to do. Um, this book tries to do that, but also kind of towards the line of, 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 I suppose, what's the word I'm looking for? Sensibilities. There are panels where things are a little bit um, non-formulaic and others where it is. The Superman picture is just awful, although it seems like I don't know what's going on there. I do not know what's going on there. The chest on the S looks, it, it just looks odd. I don't know what's going on. Um, but Supes takes her away from the radiation, so now she can die in peace. And when she comes back, she'll be back to herself. Um, is it a good start? Is this a good part of this? No, I don't know. I, I'm on the fence. I am absolutely on the fence with this. There are some bits that I really liked. Um, there's some bits that I absolutely think, well, oh my God, what's going on? Such as the cat god. Um, still, all seems to be like a bit of a precursor for what's coming on down the line. For those of you that don't know, um, next issue, <coughs> excuse me, Selena gets, uh, she joins the Suicide Squad. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's an interesting way of getting into that, isn't it, really, I suppose. But, you know, once she gets that injection in her head, and things don't go well, well, she'll be fine. She's got lives, right? She'll be fine. Um, there are a raft of varying covers for this. It is biased choice on where you go for. Um, I didn't mind it. Uh, the, as I said, the standard one is fine. Um let's see colors work well it's a dark story it's a dark area um so the colors are really kind of heavy laid the inks are quite heavy uh which kind of maybe spoils the line of what you'd expect from a, a, a feline fatel uh in the book but still it i'm still around i'm still buying it <laughs> I buy catwoman who thought about that eh? so i'm still buying catwoman um I'd be interested to see where this goes. I would hope that DC have something lined up for her that's more than than just this. Um, I don't know. Maybe she's going to be instrumental in taking down the Suicide Squad before the Suicide Squad take down the Justice League. Who knows? Who knows? Right. Two up, two down. Time for one of our adverts. Um, where shall we go? Um, have I got that one there it is time to check out no prize There you have it, the No Prize podcast, uh, which drops alternate week to us, which covers Disney Plus, MCU, and of course, maybe we'll get around some Marvel comics, as well as the infamous two minute warning. What more could you want out of a Marvel show? Right, next up is uh, Freya's second choice. Um, and it's this book. Um, so it's Green Lantern War Journal uh, number five, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Montos. Uh, Colors are by Adriana Lucas and Christopher Sotomayor. Uh, letters are by Dave Sharp. Now, I don't know what it is about Green Lanterns. Generally speaking, we don't seem to give them a fair shout. Well, I don't, since Jessica Cruz got absolutely 86, but still. Um, so, no, I don't understand why, why we don't give them a fair shout. Um, which is interesting. John Stewart is the more interesting character than Hal Jordan for sure, but still, bring back Jessica Cruz. Um, this book, as far as I can tell, uh, another book that I don't read regularly. Um, John Stewart has been gifted, granted, taken, whatever word you want to use, uh, another Green Lantern's ring. It's kind of molded to him now. Uh, it has his so John's parented by will, but the original ring welders. Um, 
willpower is imbued in the ring still, so that's going to cause some problems down the line. Um, some wonky art here on the hands of John Stewart, especially these two. I mean, it looks like in the hands backwards there, or I just don't, I just can't see how they've done that. Um, you know your paneling's gone wrong when you have to put little arrows in to tell you which way to read the book round. Just saying. Um, so this is John is back in Metropolis talking to Steele. Um, comes to light that John's mum is suffering from dementia, um, which is kind of a bit of a B plot in this. Um, John uses his ring to create um, his sister so that his sister can look after his mum. Um, so, and then she gets a little bit <coughs> Megan, sorry, excuse me, a bit Megan about it. I will protect her with all my will and all that sort of stuff. That's Megan the movie, not Megan. Hello, Megan. Um, still, interesting subplot going on there. Um, from that point on, um, he's off on a mission. Interested to see some dark stars kind of imagery there before I get attacked by more Green Lanterns. Um, why are they attacking him? I have no idea other than the fact that he's wearing uh, somebody else's ring, but by my notice, that's what Green Lantern rings are supposed to do. One Green Lantern dies, off it goes, searching the space sector for somebody without fear, you know, or else Abbott and Sarah would be still miffed that Hal Jordan has his ring. Um, kind of a an entity comes to life, it seems it's been powered by uh, the guy that exists in Stuart's new ring. Um, there's a lot going on. The colours are gorgeous. Uh, the art's a bit wonky. Now, what I would like to say, I'm going to go back a few pages, so give, give me two seconds while I do that. Um, not normally my cup of tea, Green Lantern, as I've mentioned before. However, this page is absolutely brilliant this page gives some indication of what it must be like for people dealing with uh relatives suffering from dementia in one moment um she's talking to john like it's her husband next minute it's john is john next to realizing that she's not at home by herself and she still can't find her daughter so all in all it's kind of a huge a huge kind of fracturing um for those of you who haven't seen the recent outside the panels interview uh where dementia is talked about dementia is quite simply um if you, if you think about metaphorically um imagine a bookcase and each shelf from the ground up equates to a decade of your life so one to ten at the bottom 11 to 20 is at the top 20 to 30 and so on and so forth now if you've got a bookcase and you shake it, the top shelves, the books on the top shelf will become dislodged and they'll fall off or they'll fall off and you'll put them back in a different order. That is a metaphor for dementia. That's what essentially can happen, where people um, jump from one memory to another, from one level of existence to another, and they live within that moment because that's their reality at the time. Um, heartbreaking um soul destroying but um i must say that uh kennedy johnson here has written it absolutely brilliantly what an, an absolute um not treat what's the word i'm looking for what an absolute um i'm gonna to have to go with treat it's not an absolute treat pleasure it is to read something that's taken such a such a sensitive subject written so compassionately um so i think whoever decided to that this was going to be a a plot line or a b plot uh for the stuart book um i tip my hat it's handled wonderfully um truly sympathetic to a sensitive issue uh very well done very very well done okay um i do have uh concerns that this uh this mini me is going to turn out to be a little bit too um on the button for her own good when it comes to kind of protecting mama stewart but 
we'll see where that goes um for sure um does anybody like the new judge Stewart uniform no i'm not sure on it either but still I kind of think to myself you know this is what it is right so they've been cruised back does anyone know what happened to Jess Cruz? If so, please write in and let me know. That would be fantastic. Cool. Right, okay. Last book. I told you the show was going quick. Um, right, the last book is a book that we've looked at a couple of times um, over the last couple of uh, shows. It is This is the final part of the Superman Lost Saga. This is Superman Lost number 10 of 10. Written by Christopher Priest with art by Carlo Paglian and Jose Luis. Inks are by Jason Paz, Joe Prado. Uh, I've got Julio Ferreira and Jonas Tribraid. Uh, Jamie Cox is on colours and Louis Schubert is on letters. Now, if you may recall, the last time we looked at this book, um, Clark's estranged girlfriend from sector God knows where had turned up and she was pregnant. Um, what does this mean for Lois? Um, well, turns out, <coughs> despite some soul searching and despite some stern looks and one argument, absolutely nothing. See, I used to love Doctor Who. I mean, when I talk to say Doctor Who, I mean like old school Doctor Who. When new style Doctor Who came on, that was all right, up until a point. But sooner or later, things get a little bit too science fiction-y. And what I mean by that is, yes, I know science fiction is fiction. However, there has to be a track of logic, or else how do people kind of fall feel as if they're part of the story? You know, it's a problem that, that Trek has, especially Next Gen Trek, and it's a problem that Doctor Who has. And the reason why I bring this up is because halfway through the book, we realise that it's all been an absolute scam. The last issue, last 10 issues have been a scam. What's happened is that time, space travel is like time travel, apparently, and that for this happens, that happens, there are then flashbacks to previous uh, encounters in the book. What does this mean? Um, Clark comes back after a couple of days, not the years that he's been away, or he thinks it's been a couple of days. Um, and we get flashbacks to the various things. We saw these aliens in the top left corner in the first issue. Uh, that's what happened there. Um, this happened earlier. So future Superman, or the Superman that was lost, is actually now doing something to send himself back before he got lost. Um, as you can see, that's the lasso in the event horizon of the, the black hole. Um, so then that sorted that out. But if then that, if he got sent back, who was it that left the clone sample the hair sample for her to see because then it wouldn't have happened because it would have had knock-on effect or is it one of those marvel universe things where it's created another side universe and from out there and in and just the regular guys are just the regular guys i am not entirely sure and this is where i think this book has kind of lost its way um Instead of going down the simple route and then having a complicated ramifications, we actually get a complicated route um, with no ramifications. Now, this might be the pressures of working on a big two book, or it might be the pressures of having to work on a major icon like Superman, where nothing ever changes. Uh, but still, if I'd have been buying this book, and at the end of the book, everything is as it was before i would feel quite miffed i get that the journey is important and not just the destination but come on really give us something else to hang our hat on give us something else to hang our cape on not just 
a simple, oh, well, yes, I can go back in time and do this, that, and the other. If that was the case, that you could just go back in time, then none of the stories matter about any of the characters. Because they would just go back in time. Who does Superman think he is? Barry Allen? I don't know. Um, uh, wise, this book has been quite on point for a number of issues. I don't think this issue is particularly helped out by the number of inkers on the book. Things kind of get a little bit screwy in places where consistency drops a little. Um, I'm not a big fan of stuff like this where there's no background. Um, and it's a constant thing. Is it because they're trying to, you know, speed the art process up? I don't know. But still. Um, just a disappointing, just a disappointing conclusion, I think, to a book, especially that great cliffhanger from from uh last last month when she rocks up when Hope rocks up with the baby and um the baby bump it is it just seems like they've taken one step forward and two steps back not a good not a good ending for me but you know i'm sure somebody out there would have loved it um and priest writing has although i don't like the science fiction element that just is whoisms and time travel and all that sort of stuff um it has written consistently throughout the book um i love how he writes batman so that's a good thing. Um, I love how he like writes Lois to a to a large extent. So you know, it, lots of as, aspects work. Um, get the trade if you want to get the trade, um, but if you do, it's going to be out of curiosity rather than out of any sort of meaningful, impactful book that tells a message. There you go. Anyway, that's my that's my two cents worth. The guys aren't here to defend, attack, or agree. Uh, so it's up to you guys. It's up to you, everyone out there watching the show. Please drop your comments in the comments field. Tell me whether you agree with them, disagree with them, whatnot. I am all ears. Um, normal service will resume in a fortnight's time. We will have our gang back together uh, in time for the next raft of DC books that are coming down the pipe. We've already started to see the next kind of event hinted at. Uh, the next DC event is 30 years in the making. So you take you count yourself back. What's that? 24. So 2014 is 10. So 94. That puts you one of the final crises. Helen just destroyed Star City. Um, Parallax was still a thing. Loads of different things going on there. So what was 30 years in the making, do you think? Answers on a postcard. Thank you for your patience. Um, sorry for the bridge show. I've been your host, Johnny Machine Hughes. And as always, adios. <laughs>